Okay, welcome back to the second uh, part of our meeting. Um, our featured presentation, um, Rich Lewebrand has been, a, and Vicki as well, have been uh, members of BAST since the late 70s. Um, uh, Rich was president of BAST back in about 2007. He's been the editor of the uh, Kayaking Techniques webpage on, on our website. Uh, he's been a skills clinic coordinator for decades, a uh, very active BAST member. And um, he's going to tell us about a five-week kayaking expedition this summer with a group of Baskers who had done the same trip 14 years earlier. And I'm really looking forward to hearing um, their adventures and the changes that they saw. Rich. Okay, Tom, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks for that wonderful introduction. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you where we went in case you're not familiar with Glacier Bay. Glacier Bay is in Alaska and it's in southeast Alaska, which is shown here at the arrow. And you notice from the previous slide that Glacier Bay is a national park. Well, it's even more special than that. I'd like to also point out that it is a world heritage site. And one thing that I learned many years ago through Basque is that world heritage sites are desirable. When you are looking for a place to go on vacation, check out the world heritage sites and you'll get some great ideas. Well, here's one that allows you to kayak in one of the largest world heritage sites in the world. Uh, this park is so big. It is about the size of Connecticut. It is the size of Yosemite and Yellowstone put together. So there's plenty of territory to cover here. And uh, what is special about this place is that it got totally inundated under ice starting in about 1500 and it maxed out around 1750. And uh, it had the fastest uh, retreat of all of that glacial ice in recorded history. Okay, let's take a look at some of the details here. Uh, there was a report of George Vancouver, the British uh, explorer who came in in 1794. And he found this ice sheet was extending all the way up to this line as shown here. And when he looked up at this from his boat, what he saw was 4,000 vertical feet of ice just above him. Now that's about the size of Mount Diablo. So that's huge. And it was also 20 miles wide, and it extended all the way up to uh, the mountains behind it. And that completely filled a, a glacier bay. It was nothing but ice, and uh, it was just amazing. Well, 85 years later, John Muir came to check it out. And by then, uh, the glacier had receded to here. And John Muir learned a lot of things that he applied to his knowledge of glaciers that he was uh, seeking in, in uh, Yosemite at the time. Well, uh, gee, there's plenty of wonderful stuff that I wanna show you. I'll have lots of pictures for you about some of the wildlife and some mountains that are spectacular. There are mountains that are 15,000 feet high. It's, it's really quite remarkable. Now, in our trip, we spent five weeks exploring Glacier, Glacier Bay. We started here at park headquarters. And the first thing we did was to paddle up through the Beardsley Islands. And we camped at uh, this little island. And then we continued north to a place that we will call the East Arm. OK, uh, so Glacier Bay will di be divided into two arms. There's the East Arm, and then there's the West Arm. And so we spent three weeks in the East Arm. We spent two weeks in the West Arm. And um, yeah, with that, I think we're ready to uh, just uh, start our trip. Well, about a month before the trip, uh, we mailed our food in advance. And uh, here's a chance for me to introduce you to my colleagues on the trip. This is Vicki, Vicki Louisbrand. This is Dick Ryan. Diana Van Kanijnenberg and uh, Frank Balistrieri. And we were on this particular day uh, mailing our, our, uh, our uh, bear canisters. Okay, since I wasn't in the picture, I'll put up this picture of me that was taken a few weeks into the trip. 
And here's Diana once again. I need to tell you that Diana was the trip initiator and she did a marvelous job just taking care of all of these incredible details. She was able to book trips for uh, reservations on airplanes and, and in the lodge when things were really full, uh, she gets a lot of credit for this trip. And this is Frank's um, uh, husband. Now, this is Frank, which is Diana's husband. And uh, he is shown with the, his nice new camera. He had uh, several of the photos that we're gonna present here. And I was really pleased that he did such a great job with his photography. Dick Ryan was along as well. And Dick Ryan was also along in the trip 14 years ago. It was uh, Dick and uh, Frank and Diana and Vicky and I. And uh, on that particular trip, uh, that, uh, that full group was, that, well, part of the group was there for six weeks, but Vicki and I were there just for the last three weeks. And uh, so this is a repeat performance. So we got to see some changes that took place. Okay, we're off and ready to start our paddling. Uh, one thing you'll notice, this was mid-June. This was uh, June the 13th. Look at all of the snow on the mountains. This is just spectacular. You just don't get to see that much snow, but uh, they had lots of snow up in Glacier Bay this year. So in our paddle, we went towards the Beardsleys we went through a Beardsley cut and uh, it took us a whole day to paddle there. Uh, once we arrived, uh, uh, the temperature started to go down, the wind started to blow a bit and we pulled out one of the tools that we use for this that really was very helpful. Uh, 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 it's a storm cog. Cog is short for a cagoule, it's a French word. And uh, a tr trick that I learned years ago is that with the Gore-Tex dry suits that we wear, once that wind starts to blow or the temperature starts to drop, it, you really feel the chill and you need to stop that somehow. And one of the easy ways to do that is to have some kind of a windbreaker. Break, it could be nylon or something fancier. This particular kind actually can extend over the combing of your boat. And it was really convenient wearing both on land and at sea. Uh, this saved our bacon a lot of times. Okay, at the Beardsleys, at the Beardsleys, uh, there was this beautiful view. Uh, this is uh, about 11.15, as you can see, this is twilight. This is, uh, um, this, is, this is way north. So we have long, long days up in the Beardsleys. And I love the color and I love the plants in the foreground and these beautiful mountains these are the mountains from the West Arm. We're looking over to them. Okay, uh, the day that we're leaving the Beardsleys, we have almost a full moon. This is two days after the full moon. We have a 22 foot tidal change that's been predicted. And that's gonna go into a minus four foot, uh, a, min uh, a minus four foot tide. And uh, gee, that could be a really long carry for your boats. So what we decided to do is we wanted to position our kayaks so that they would be close to the high water to minimize the long, long, long carry. Uh, we had experienced the very long carry uh, when we landed and we really didn't want to go through that again if we could avoid it. And so uh, we did this pretty consistently. Okay, uh, in order to have our high tide uh, launch, we needed to start at three o'clock in the morning. And uh, here we are, ready to do that. We've got our boats all packed, we're ready to go. And out here in the distance is this whale that is just tempting us with this spy hopping and breaching. And this whale didn't make, he probably knew that we couldn't really watch him because <laughs> we were busy packing our boats. But we suffered through that. And uh, uh, yeah, he was uh, nice to have. And we uh, said sayonara to that whale. Okay, as you can imagine, with such a big tide that's now dropping, and we're paddling north, uh, we had a negative tide to deal with. And uh, we traveled about uh, two and a half miles in six hours. It was just really wicked. Uh, and it, we were wiped out. I went through two energy bars in my pocket 
we needed to rest. And so we, we stopped at this place for a rest. And I, uh, we were up here, up in this zone that has the seaweed, nice slippery kelp. And I thought, oh, this will be a nice place to, to stop. It's just not very far. We can go have a short rest. Well, um, and it didn't quite out work, work out that way. The tide was so falling so quickly that uh, we didn't want to, our boats to beach. So we kept on floating them farther and farther and farther down until finally uh, we just couldn't deal with this anymore. And the biggest problem was that there was wind that was blowing our kayaks towards the shore, as well as this problem with the, the falling surf. So um, this was, it's a real issue when your boats beach. Um, it means that you're stuck there until uh, you have to, until you can carry them out or, or refloat them. Uh, it's very difficult to carry your boats out here because you have so many barnacles here and you have very, very rough, rocky stuff. Uh, here's a picture of some barnacles. You can see how sharp they are. And gee, if you fall on them, uh, it can cause uh, some hardship on, on your skin. Okay, so what is the strategy that one might use to avoid getting beached like this? Well, uh, kayakers use uh, a technique called the sea wash anchor, and uh, it's now been renamed uh, as a Shimshian anchor. And uh, if you do a Google search on sea wash, sea wash anchor, it'll get you to the right place. So what is a sea wash anchor? It is a temporary anchorage for your boat or boats uh, while you're taking a short break on shore and while you have uh, rising or falling currents. So where's the anchor here? The anchor is about where the arrow is here uh, that you see. And so there's an anchor that is in the water that is holding these boats in place and Vicky is holding on to a rope that's uh, allow, can allow her to retrieve it. Okay, so how do you set it up? Well, you start with a mesh bag. And when you travel, this mesh bag can be empty, but when you need to use it as an anchor, you just get some rocks and you fill it into the bag. And you need about a hundred feet of rope. You take the middle of the rope and you tie it into the bag. And then you have two ends of the rope. You attach one end to the bow and the other end uh, you hang on to because that's going to be your retrieval line. So once you have all of that set up, how do you launch it? Well, you place the mesh bag on your, on your deck near the bow and um, make sure that the ropes can run freely. Okay, then all you have to do is give the boat or boats a push. So you push it out until you're convinced that it's far enough so that the wind won't blow things back to shore. And then you yank on the rope and that pushes, pulls this uh, a mesh bag off the deck of the boat, plops it into the water and your anchor is set. Uh, nothing to it. Okay, to retrieve your boats, you just start pulling on your retrieval line and you can see how that uh, mesh bag is all set up so that you can just drag it to shore and in turn, it will drag the boats back to shore as well. So that's the sea wash anchor. And if you're gonna go to a place that has wild uh, tidal exchanges, I suggest you learn how to do this. Uh, the parts for that only weigh about one pound uh, without the rocks. And uh, it's pretty handy to have uh, uh, for a certain time. By the way, those images were taken 14 years ago by Vicki um, on, our, on our previous trip to Glacier Bay. Okay, at this point, the water has come in and we're now heading north towards Darforth Island. And this is Garforth Island, about five miles off into the distance. What we see is just above Garforth Island is a familiar mountain. It will be familiar to you by the end of this presentation. This is Mount Wright. And uh, just below Mount Wright is a place uh, that the uh, National Park Service has designated as a pickup and drop off site. And we'll see it repeatedly as we go farther north. So we're off and running. Okay. We arrived at our uh, destination, Garforth Island, and uh, gee, this place also had whales. Uh, we couldn't decide which place had 
better whales. Um, but uh, we put up with it. And uh, once again, the storm kind of worked out really nicely for Vicky. Okay, then we were unloading boats at this point. You can see Mount Wright up here in the background. We'll become familiar with that. And uh, here's the point at which you uh, do a lot of uh, unloading of your boats. And of course, it's most convenient if you arrive at high tide, which we had done here. So this was a piece of cake in terms of carrying our gear up, up to the beach. Then we had dinner and we had a little fire. Where there were, was a dolphin that came by and this was actually the only dolphin we saw in the whole five week time we were there. It was really great to see. Him. And uh, when we were exploring the island the next day, uh, uh, I realized that there was some shale on the beach. I says, Vic Vicky, there's a, there's a shale at the beach. And she says, wait, I'll go get my credit card. <laughs> Sorry, Vicky. <laughs> really, she's not that much of a spendthrift. Anyway, uh, we did find this nice rock that had layers of shale and uh, it was really, really pretty. We really enjoyed it. Okay, over at my boat, there was lots of these little red mites that were crawling around. These have the name red velvet mites. Uh, they're only a tenth of an inch long, but uh, boy, they're really beautiful and quite harmless. They're related to spiders, they're all arachnids. Uh, but this particular one is a mite. Okay, uh, this is dinner. Uh, I look at this image and I think of all of the meals that we had out and I think, wow, since we've come back, we haven't had an outdoor picnic for dinner since. And I thought, wow, that's really the good life is to be able to, to do that every single night. Uh, and I, I kind of miss that. Okay, one of the luxury items that we brought along on the trip were these folding chairs that we discovered. Uh, we used to carry tripod stools, each of which would weigh two pounds. So two of these tripod stools would be four pounds. Turns out these only weigh a pound each and they're tiny little things that fit easily into your boat. So this really added a lot, added a lot of comfort for the trip. Now, I like to do a lot of light painting and so uh, I did uh, get some pictures of some tents with light painting. And um, gee, the next day after I took that picture, there was a problem with Frank and Diana's tent. Uh, we needed to repair this tent. And uh, the reason was that the tent pole broke. Well, okay, it was great because I had a repair sleeve. So I got it out and uh, we put it on, duct taped it in place, and uh, set it all up, and the sleeve broke, broke in half. And so we took one of the halves and then reinforced it in this clever way. I should say Frank reinforced it. He actually did all of the work. He got out his knife. It was actually part of his Leatherman toolkit, and he whittled it down, and he used uh, some uh, zip ties to re repair that and you can see what a fantastic job that he did for that. Now, unfortunately, it turns out that they used uh, not very good metal for this particular tent and it kept on breaking. So uh, this repair eventually broke as well. And so we ended up, or Frank, I should say, ended up replacing the, uh, this tent pole with uh, another tent pole that was hold, holding up his, uh, uh, the back of his tent, the, uh, yeah, the back of his tent, the vestibule. Okay, this particular morning, whoops, this particular morning, uh, sorry, this misbehaving. We had planned on waking up early to leave the island, but we woke up in the middle of this huge squall. It was like a winter storm. You could hear the wind howling and the rain was dumping. And uh, I decided we should have a, a, a meeting this morning. So within about 30 seconds of this meeting, I suggested that maybe we want to sleep in today because it's so wicked out there. 
And within 30 seconds, everybody agreed. And uh, we ended up spending a rest day here, a duff day to take up uh, the, the problem here. Okay, this um, boat was an interesting charter vessel that we saw cruising around. And it may be interest to some of you uh, because this particular boat carries kayaks. It has kayaks for 12 people and it has uh, other kayaks for, for, let's see, for one other guide. And then one other person is in that Zodiac. So with this gear, these people can go all over Glacier Bay and see lots of things uh, without a lot of the work that we had to do in kayaks where we had to carry our boats up and down each day. So I thought I would just mention that and that's actually the um, URL as, as to how that could be re uh, reached. Okay, so now we're ready to launch and uh, I wanna point out some of the quality of the shore here. We see in the foreground, there are these barnacles just totally covering this part of the rock. And then just above the barnacle layer, we have the muscle layer. Well, you can imagine what those layers could do to our hypalon covered feather craft kayaks. And so we chose not to uh, push our boat, scraping them across these muscles and barnacles. Rather, we would wait until the water would come up to them and then just float right over them. So this stick in the water is a strategy that we learned uh, when Jack and Susan Pines Basque members they are, and, and, uh, and Diana and Vicky and I were on the Stikeen River, we learned that if you're waiting for the water to come up, if you put the sticky in the water, then you can time how long it takes to go from there to here. So that's our Stikeen River trick. Okay, this is my kayak, my feather craft, and I wanted to point out the mesh bag that I use for the sea wash anchor. And there's also this blue bag, which is a, a dry bag with a very special zipper on it that is really quite secure and easily open. And it's great for carrying electronic equipment. So I carried my camera equipment in here. Uh, there's another bag on the back that I used. It was mainly empty, but uh, I had a backpack that is used for carrying a camera. I took that along as well. Now, I'm not a fan of carrying bags on the top deck, but uh, I needed to do, that, to do that for this gear. Okay, so we're launched, we're on our way, and it started to rain uh, before we got to our destination and kept on raining right through the evening. And uh, it really wasn't a pleasant night because we really were tired and hungry and we didn't feel like cooking dinner. So we just had a snack of our, from some of our lunch food and we skipped dinner that evening. Now the next morning, the most amazing thing happened. I heard this sound like a bumblebee that was bigger, the, the biggest bumblebee that I've ever, ever seen and ever not seen. It turns out it was actually a hummingbird the head crawled under the rain fly of the tent and he got stuck, he couldn't get out. So he couldn't leave until we figured out that we need to release uh, the, the attachments of the tent underneath the rain fly and eventually he could find his way out. So this was a Rufus hummingbird and this was fortuitous because it gave us a chance to see up close a nice uh, Rufus hummingbird. Okay, this is another um, uh, dinner time. You'll notice here that bear canisters are on the scene. And indeed, bear canisters are required for everybody that goes into the backcountry. And there's no problem with uh, getting them if you don't have your own. Uh, the Park Service will provide them for you at no cost. But it's very, very important. Since they've been using bear canisters, if, totally minimize the, the problems that they have with bears. Uh, here is a bumblebee that I saw on uh, Carl Parsnip. That was kind of nice. And now we're getting ready to launch to go farther north up towards the McBride uh, Glacier. 
And now we're looking back towards where we came. We came from this uh, region on the right. Uh, the, the, this you'll notice is uh, Mount Light. And uh, we came around the corner here <clears throat> and uh, we're heading off to the left here as we know. Okay, so there are the four paddlers. And this is again, Mount Wright. And we're heading towards McBride Glacier. Along the way, we came to some cliffs. Uh, this one on the left was very beautiful. It looked pretty obvious to me that this had been scraped by some glaciers. And I thought, oh yeah, John Muir wrote about that. He wrote about the glaciers that were being scraped here. And he had seen things like that in Yosemite and put two and two together, realizing that, oh, it's the glaciers that are sliding down the mountain that are causing it's, uh, these uh, scraping marks. And uh, that's why they're there. Okay, just beyond those cliffs is uh, our first view of the Riggs Glacier. Now, the Riggs Glacier was one of the big ones in the East Arm. Uh, it is actually no longer calving glaciers. Icebergs. Uh, calving icebergs. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, this is Diana at Riggs Glacier. And a couple days later, Frank and I went out on, uh, on uh, an expedition to get some water, to retrieve water for the group. And we found much nicer conditions. There was really not much wind. And uh, look at the turquoise color of the water. It's just gorgeous. And that's caused by the material that is scraped off the rocks by the glaciers. This fine rock called glacial till gets spilled into the water and it absorbs light selectively. So what we see is this wonderful turquoise color. Uh, Frank and I really enjoyed that particular day. Now, just across from the uh, McBride Glacier is this cliff that's called the White Thunder Ridge. White Thunder is the Clinket name, that's the indigenous people, the Clinket name for the explosions, uh, the sounds that you hear when calving takes place. And there was lots of calving that would take place just across the water, uh, over here by the McBride Glacier and the Riggs Glacier. And I, I like the reflections here. Now, when we arrived at uh, the McBride Inlet, uh, we unfortunately were at a low water level. And of course, one of the things that we need to do to protect all of our gear uh, when there's a high tide coming in later in the evening is we have to get all that stuff to the highest ground that we can find that will be above the highest uh, uh, high tide line that we get that particular evening. So we discovered that there was an inlet. There were actually two. One inlet was through here, through this passage, and another one would come in from the left-hand side of my screen. And we found that if we would come back here at high tide, we could take our boats from the low water line and get them into the lagoon, then tie them up to a rock and leave them at this high point here. So that's how we solve the problem of how do we keep our gear from flowing away. And that's a pretty important thing to do. To get the kayaks to the high ground, uh, Vicki and I chose to use uh, some rope and we lined our kayaks around so that we wouldn't have to get in and paddle our kayaks because we were already out of our dry suits. And we just lined our boats into this inlet. And from there, it was just a relatively short carry. Uh, uh, short carry to get to the access ground that was up in this lagoon. So once we're, our boats were tied off in this lagoon, uh, we could then begin enjoying ourselves for the evening. Now we camped in this alder uh, uh, thicket region and um, it was right next to the tent. <clears throat> and you'll, we, what we found is that 
just below here off to the right is the McBride Inlet. Okay, what was in the inlet here? It's a sea otter. Well, we saw lots of sea otters down in, in the um, Beardsleys. In fact, probably more sea otters that, that it, than it can handle, but uh, there were relatively few up here. We only saw the one sea otter up by the icebergs. Uh, the, the icebergs, of course, have come from the McBride Glacier, which is actively calving glaciers. The McBride Glacier is, okay. the McBride Glacier is up here around that corner. Turns out you can't see it because uh, the glacier at this point is four miles beyond where you would enter this inlet. Okay, so let's look at some nomenclature for glacier pieces. The tiny ones are called growlers. They can extend about three feet above the water. If you've got one that goes up five feet above the water, like this one, we could call those bergy bits. So this could be an example of a bergy bit, which is beached. And if you don't feel like learning all that new jargon, we'll just call all of them icebergs. And these particular icebergs are beached because the tide goes up and down in this inlet. And uh, at low tide, they typically beach. And then at high tide, they start floating again. Well, this brought back some memories from 14 years ago when uh, the four of us visited uh, this same location. Uh, we were coming along nonchalantly um, uh, planning to enter this, um, this inlet. And, okay, here's an aerial image, which I took from Google Earth. And uh, this aerial image shows the location of the McBride Glacier. So this is, all, this is about uh, four miles from the opening. This meaning the glacier is about four miles away from this terminal moraine. You see that the glacier, when it would cab all of this material, and it would all well, it would all flow out towards the the opening. Uh, it would drop off the dirt particles, and that's where the moraine built up, and so it provided a constriction. And so what we discovered is that once we entered through that moraine, the Bernoulli effect was going on. Namely, the water accelerates when you if you have water in a hose and you squeeze the hose, the water is going to start traveling faster. And that's what happened here. The water gets accelerated. And the next thing we knew, we were going very, very fast towards this inlet. And uh, we were totally out of control. It looked like uh, we were getting in some big trouble. So here are a couple of pictures that we took back in 2008. Again, Vicky took this one. Um, this picture shows uh, Dick Ryan and all of the icebergs that we were getting pushed into by this flooding current and there's really not a lot of place to go in between them. So we felt like we were up marbles in a pinball machine just getting shot into this group of strainers in a wild raging river and we realized that this is not a safe place to be. So we turned around as fast as we could, paddled close to the shore where the current would be smallest, and we paddled as hard as we could to uh, find any currents that we might have indent from indentations in the side of the cliff. And we were able to bear up to, to get out just barely. It was really a co close call in this place that they call the vortex of doom. And uh, I need, need to tell you about a reference book that is now available, that just has become available within the last couple of years, written by a guy named David Barr, B-A-H-R. It's called The Kayaker's Companion to Glacier Bay. And uh, David is a glaciologist, and we met him before we came out on our trip. 
And we talked about perhaps going into here. He suggested very strongly that we not do that. Uh, and what he told us is that uh, the McBride Glacier at the moment is in a period of transition. Okay, I'm gonna go back a couple of slides to uh, the, the, the glacier is now in transition. Uh, at the stage here, we at this stage we have the toe of the glacier under the seawater. And that seawater is warming that ice, which makes it melt more quickly. And that leads to the calving of the glacier. And in this particular image, that's what caused all of these icebergs to form down here. Now, uh, this glacier is actually retreating. And at the present, it's up about here. It's starting to reach that point where the elevation of the land is starting to go higher. And so this glacier will no longer be immersed into the seawater. We would say that it's grounding. And when that grounding occurs, we won't see icebergs flowing out quite as much. And it'll be much safer to visit. And uh, David uh, Barr suggested that we really would be much safer because uh, you really don't know when this particular glacier is going to start carving, prof uh, calving profusely, uh, which is something that it has done in the, in the past. And I'd like to point out as well that the National Park Service kayak rangers are forbidden from going into here with their kayaks. Uh, they do take this pretty seriously, and uh, we decided that we would abort our plan of paddling into here. Okay, so let's come over to another look at some bergy bits. Uh, if you look at a bergy bit into the light, you'll see these dark uh, places where it's uh, it's uh, it's very blue, where the ice is very strongly compact, but a front lit lit bergy bit will appear more white because probably of all of the dissolved air in it. So you you get really different kinds of pictures depending upon how you choose to expose your images. And I like the shapes of these things. Okay, uh, after we left. Um, the McBride Glacier. We went back south down towards Point George. Um, Point George is on the other side of Mount Wright from this. This is Mount Wright, and uh, we're about a day's paddle away from, uh, from our previous campsite once again. One thing you should notice about this is how much snow there still is. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is late June early. It's, it's late June days later. Yeah, it's about late June, and there's still a whole lot of snow left, and that's very impressive. Now going around the corner, uh, here's a Mount Wright, and this one is called Mount Case. Now on a previous trip to Alaska. Somebody told us that this Alaskan state bird is the mosquito. Well, it probably isn't, but uh, there are sure a lot of mosquitoes. Uh, this is what our tent looked like in the morning when we had looked out at them. And fortunately, those mosquitoes are on the other side of that fabric than we were. So it's really it's nice to have a good tent. Now, here's a hot tip for you. We didn't know about this, but we learned about it from David Barr's book. If you would take your tent and your rain fly and soak it in a permethrin solution, that will act as a repellent towards the mosquitoes. And there'll be much less of a problem for you. So that's another trip to keep in mind uh, when you're going into mosquito country. Okay, there's some oy oyster catchers uh, at this particular place. Point George. And uh, this one seemed to be saying to me, don't step on my egg. How do I know that? Well, uh, these oyster catchers have nice, beautiful speckled eggs that they leave right in the open. And 
somebody could easily just go walk along and not notice the, the egg and step on it. So when that happens, one of the parents comes along and tries to let you know, hey, you're a little too close to my egg. Uh, I want you to, to change your behavior. Now, here's one of the strategies that they use to do that. This is uh, a strategy that I like to call the broken wing trick. Uh, they feign having a broken wing so that you will come towards them and chase them, perhaps to capture them or for whatever reason, but that will draw you away from that particular area uh, that is close to their eggs. So that's a fun thing that not only oyster catchers do, but there are other birds that do that as well. Okay, this is one of the fun parts of my presentation. Uh, I call it the whale show. I'm going to show you 10 images that I got of one whale dive. And let's start going through whales. This is a humpback whale, yeah. And there's, a, of course, a dorsal fin. And oh, he's starting to get nice curvature here on this dorsal fin. And uh, that suggests that, oh, maybe a tail is going to start coming up. And things start looking really exciting, especially when the water starts pouring off the tail and you're backlit looking into the sun. And then you see this spectacular view of this tail and you think, oh my God, all of this stuff happens so quickly in an ordinary view of this that you just have no appreciation of how beautiful all of this is. And going to the end of the sequence, we could get to here. And so I selected what I considered to be the best one of the group. And I decided to do some post-processing on it. So uh, this is one of my favorite images of the trip. I call this one a whale of a tail. And uh, it's uh, an advantage that you, you can, you, that, to be able to do that, you need to have a, a nice long um, teleconverter. Okay, the agreed time to launch is now. Dick is saying that, uh, okay, we've uh, scheduled our departure at a particular time. We're at that time in his watch and here he is ready to go. And Dick, to his credit, was spot on. We were, the rest of us were a little later than, uh, than he was. And so uh, kudos to Dick for learning that technique uh, very quickly. Okay, getting back to Garforth Island, there was this beautiful weather change that I loved. Uh, there is a oyster catcher family. This one had three chicks. And uh, not only was it the mother, but uh, the male was there as well. And um, Another thing I wanted to show you is one, a picture of this lichen that's sitting on a rock. Now, lichens are one of the key features involved in uh, plants, plant succession. Okay, uh, mosses and lichens tend to be some of the things that form first on top of these rocks, but then some flowers called dryas come along and they start growing and they can add nitrogen to the soil and that allows the alders to start sprouting and then the bruce and then come the hemlock. And so here's what you see in Glacier Bay in this uh, sequence that we call plant succession. Down close to the park headquarters, there was, there's the mature forest, the spruce hemlock forests, and not so much of the lichens and the dryas. But up bay, uh, closer to all of the glaciers, you see more lichens and dreas and uh, fewer of the spruce hemlock forests. So that's what plant succession is all about. Now this particular, okay, uh, there's a, a, the dryas plant, that's what they look like. They're the nit nitrogen fixers. And this particular day, Dick had suggested, hey, let's go for a walk around this island. And it was less than three miles around. And uh, we knew we'd be okay if we would just go out at low tide, but uh, 
I think maybe we were just uh, delayed a little bit in leaving. So when we got around to the far end of the island, uh, we found that, uh, gee, we couldn't get around some rocks. So what we had to do was to uh, figure out how to get through this mess. I, we could either swim around the rocks or we would have to go inland and we chose to go inland. And uh, we did some terrible bushwhacking through all of this Devil's Club. This is Devil's Club at the top here. This uh, lower stuff is called Goat's Beard. And it was terrible. These pickers would just get into your hands. And they were with me for about two weeks after this little episode. Uh, it was just terrible. Um, so this is the kind of hike that we might describe as type two fun. And you might get an idea of that by the expression on Dick's face. For those of you that don't know what type two fun is, type one fun is fun that you're having while you're doing it and fun talking about it. Type two fun is fun that was terrible while you are doing it, but it's not so bad talking about it when you get home. So this is an example of type two fun. And when I finally said, hey, Dick, Look at that, we have a clear shot back to our campsite. Oh, he totally changed his expression and everything was okay from then on. So here we are getting ready to break our camp for the next day. Um, and um, next morning we are getting ready to uh, go to our pickup where they're gonna take us uh, back to reprovision. So here we are uh, loading our boats in the dark. We paddle over to the drop off. And next thing you know, this grizzly bear starts walking down the beach. And I would imagine that grizzly bears visit drop off sites in a hurry because, gee, what do people do when they're in the front country and there's nothing to do? They pull out their cell phones. In the back country, you don't have to do your cell phone a lot. You pull out your snacks, right? And maybe people drop their snap, snacks off. Anyway, we were so happy that this bear was so well uh, behaved. Uh, he didn't show any interest in either the kayaks or us. Uh, this was a nice view that we had to the Fairweather Range. This is about 10,000 feet high. Mount Fairweather itself is 15,000 feet. And finally, the tour boat came to pick us up at eight o'clock. And it, this was great because we had a whole day to go up bay and visit some of the glaciers. They took us to the Marjorie Glacier. And what this boat does, it stops in front of the Marjorie Glacier for 30 minutes to allow you to witness the calving. So what you have here is all of these jagged peaks extending above you uh, 200 feet. And when they have, they fall down and make a lot of noise and it's really, really fun to watch. So uh, it was great to be able to spend that 30 minute time. By the way, this uh, glacier is about a mile wide. It's about 21 miles long as it goes up uh, close to Mount Fairweather. And uh, this is one of the glaciers that is still advancing. So it's, it's one of the active glaciers. The other one that's uh, well-renowned and maybe even more beautiful is the Johns Hopkins Glacier. And they took us over there and oh, we had a wonderful full view of that as well. And then they took us back to Bartlett Cove. We had our view of the Fairweather Range and now it's time to re reprovision. We had two days to do this. We had fantastic weather. Look, it was 70 degrees. And uh, this is way up at 55 degrees north latitude. And uh, gee, that's very unusual. We were having, it was great. But uh, the next day we were going to get back on the boat and head north once again. Now the first two birds that I will show you uh, will, were taken uh, from the tour boat at South Marble Island. This one is a pigeon guillemot. Uh, notice that it has bright red legs. And the next one 
uh, will be puffins. Both of these kinds of birds are in the family of alcids, which means that uh, these are birds that actually swim underwater and they swim using only their wings. So they swim the same way that pelicans do. Puffin. I'm sorry, penguins, penguins do. I, I got that mixed up. Thank you, Vicki. Yeah, pelican, penguins can swim underwater and so can these puffins. And you see that the smaller wing size allows for better manipulation of their wings underwater. Uh, this is the breeding uh, plumage of the tufted puffin. And uh, I saw this puffin start to fly. It started running across the water. And I got another shot when I was about there. And finally he launched off and took off into flight. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that make a nice collage, a nice little composite? So I decided to put these together and show this puffin running across the water and showing how it launches itself off into space. So this is a, another one of my favorite images. Now, also from the boat, we saw some mountain goats. Uh, mountain goats were uh, uh, molting. Um, this one's looking pretty shaggy. Uh, the one on the left in this image uh, shows a molting uh, mountain goat as well. And uh, this one was also interesting. Uh, this mountain goat has stretched its legs for whatever reason. And uh, finally, our boat has taken us to the drop off, Kate, uh, drop off at Skidmore Cove, and we form a uh, we form a uh, fireman's chain. Okay. So the crew sends us off. And we're ready to head towards the Reed Glacier the next morning. And we find that this Reed Glacier is also no longer a uh, calving. It's a uh, grounded glacier. The next one is Lamplu Glacier. And this one still is a tidewater glacier. This is a tidewater glacier only at high tide. So we have a couple of hero shots. And then we find it's time to go find a campsite because it's already 7.30 in the evening. And that allows us to see this nice view of the mountains uh, side lit. We got some very nice photographs here. Um, um, there's one at night with the moon out. A uh, similar one the next morning was taken in the daylight where you have full spectrum light. And this campsite was just spectacular. We decided <clears throat> that this was our favorite campsite of all. And what was special about it is that from our tents, we could see two tidewater glaciers. There's the Johns Hopkins Glacier, <clears throat> and there's the Lamplu Glacier. And uh, this point in between is called Confusion Point. It uh, truly was spectacular. And Diane agreed she was there photographing the Lamplu Glacier just in front of me. And then I took some telephoto uh, panoramas of this and uh, we really enjoyed that. There was some, some nice birds at this campsite as well. There was a mated pair of plovers. And um, this is our uh, trip where we're gonna, this next day, paddle up towards the Johns Hopkins Glacier. So here we are starting from our campsite close to Orange Point. Uh, we're heading past this alluvial fan at the Topeka Glacier. And there is that beautiful Johns Hopkins Glacier. And what we see is that we're getting beautiful skies of the type that photographers love. Uh, not the whole cloudless blue sky thing, but the photography was really getting good here. And we really enjoyed seeing these various images of the Johns Hopkins Glacier. Uh, I'd like to point out the Gilman Glacier here as well. Uh, this uh, glacier here 
coming in from the left-hand side is the Gilman Glacier. This other glacier is the Johns Hopkins. Both are advancing, both are tidewater glaciers. And they've met and they've separated frequently, but uh, at the present time, they're together. Okay, the clouds were starting to cover uh, the, the mountains, and so we felt it was time to go back. Uh, Diana uh, po is pointing out, pointing her paddle directly to the Gilman Glacier. And we say adieu to the beautiful peaks and we start heading back. Uh, we see this other glacier. We haven't noticed this is a hanging glacier that's totally covered in dirt. <clears throat> and then we head back to our tent, going past some waterfalls. Orange Point is orange because of all of the iron in the rocks. And uh, take a few more views to the to the mountains. And this one is actually one of my favorites. Okay, it's, I like it even better than this one. Can you imagine that? Okay, after two days of paddling, we went to Hugh Miller Inlet. Uh, we're under a cooking shelter here. Uh, we have time for some flower shots. And next thing we know, there's a bear that's walking around uh, right towards us. And we thought, well, what are we gonna do here? Well, let's group up together and let that bear know we're here. So we watched this beautiful grizzly bear just go around overturning rocks. And it was, he's very, very strong. He can overturn them easily. He's got all of these claws that he can use as tools. The gulls clean up all the leftovers. And uh, this was a wonderful bear. It uh, once again was very well behaved. And uh, uh, this was uh, taken in the morning. We saw him once again in the evening. He seemed to be a regular doing the circuit at low tide. The next day we did a kayak trip with the whales and we saw a nice fluke. We saw a pot of three whales that were together. And we have several images of these taken from the kayaks. And another tail shot, also showing the, the back. And suddenly this pod of three turns into a pod of four. These whales are heading right for Dick Ryan. And we're thinking, oh, I hope Dick Ryan doesn't run over these guys. But there is a nice view, by the way, of a view of the, uh, the blowhole on that particular one. And uh, Dick must have had a spectacular view of the whales. And <clears throat> maybe he'll let us know. Uh, this is a shot taken by Diana, who uh, <clears throat> I took this out of a movie that she made. Here is a blowhole that is shooting water out of it. And uh, there are too many good blowhole pictures. I think Diana got the best blowhole. So at this point, we're paddling down Charpentier Inlet, nice waterfall. And then we return to our campsite. And next thing we know, another bear comes by, bigger than the first one. And th this one comes from behind our tents. And we totally caught us by surprise. In fact, Frank was out taking pictures and backing up. He almost stepped on this poor bear, but the bear didn't seem to mind. And the uh, bear just kind of walked off into the sunset. And uh, that next day, we went to catch our boat, take it to take us back. And uh, I'm going to leave you with this final thought about uh, things to do in Glacier Bay. <clears throat> this is taken from something that is posted on the Glacier Bay website. Under things to do, it lists wilderness adventures and it says, Glacier Bay is above all a wilderness park. Its greatest rewards go to those who are willing to sweat a bit and sleep on the ground. And I say that, that is really great advice. That if you are willing to put up with being uncomfortable a little bit, 
uh, you will love Glacier Bay and you will be able to enjoy all of the wonderful things that I was able to show you here. If uh, you enjoy less, uh, enjoy more comfort than that, uh, you could uh, choose alternate ways to travel maybe uh, on that, uh, that charter boat uh, that you saw earlier or perhaps on a cruise. And that is the end of my presentation. I do need though to point out a very important reference here. This reference is to David Barr's book, The Kayaker's Companion to Glacier Bay. Uh, so if you can just remember The Kayaker's Companion and Glacier Bay, uh, you will get this hit in Google. And uh, <clears throat> it's an ebook. E uh, there it comes in three volumes, and they also have a nautical chart that he sells along with it. If anybody is contemplating going there, I would <clears throat> I very highly recommend that to you. Okay, um, Tom, that's all I have. Rich, uh, I'm just blown away by those photos and by your adventures. Um, I know it's late. I know some people need to leave, but if people want to answer questions and if Rich is willing to stay a little longer, um, then let's keep it going. Okay, I am willing to answer questions. How did you arrange your, uh, your food resupply? Oh, well, that was tricky. Uh, the only thing that we could figure out is that we would have to take the tour boat back from where we were up bay back to the park headquarters and then buy another ticket going back out uh, the next day. So it wasn't Rich, expensive, but it, it got the job done. Rich, can you unshare your screen? Oh, um, yes. I wanted to give people a little bit of time to write down these references here. Okay. Uh, you look much bigger now, Ellen. Thank you for that. <laughs> Rich, uh, did you rent the boats or were those your own? Uh, those are our own. Um, there is a boat rental there and uh, the boats are in demand. So put in your, your request early if you're going to do that. There are no roads leading into Glacier Bay. So if you were going to bring your own boat, you'd probably need to come in on the ferry. We have folding boats. And so we just put them onto the airplane and then flew into Gustavus, which has a big airport. And then the taxi took us right to the, to the water. It was great, very convenient. That was the other question. Where did you launch from? We launched right from the park headquarters. Uh, there is that um, kayak rental place that is right next to the ranger station. And uh, it was very convenient. We hid our boats in the bushes at night. And then we had to get up very early to load our boats onto the, the uh, tour boat uh, so that they would be ready to go in time to load passengers. <clears throat> so we had to be ready by 6.30. That was in Gustavus. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The launch place was Gustavus. The park headquarters, where is that? It was the Bartlett park Cove. headquarters, right? Bartlett, at, Bartlett Cove. In Bartlett Cove, yes. Just so, outside of just outside of Gustavus. Got it. Oh, yes, it's 10 miles from Gustavus. You take a taxi from Gustavus to Bartlett Cove, and that is where the park headquarters are. Sorry, I didn't point that out. So I questioned, um, I saw all of you in feather crafts. Did you all own the feather crafts or did you rent them? Uh, we all own feather crafts. Years ago, there was a group purchase that was arranged. Um, gee, this was back in 2003. And uh, Diana and Vicki and I decided that we would get together and buy some feather crafts, that they would, would get us through our whole kayaking career. <laughs> and so really, we've been paddling and expeditioning together in feather crafts uh, during that whole time. Smart move. It was a good move. They're in demand now. Uh, they're no longer being made, but they work so well that people really want them. Well, I'm sure Ross Wang could give a, a run for the uh, the Oru in competition. <laughs> <laughs> well, it takes a little longer to put together our boats than it does his. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, he seems to rock that thing. But, right. but they are a little more seaworthy. But to that, there was actually a person who was in an Oru kayak paddling in McBride Inlet. And I was so afraid that he was going to get squished by the iceberg. <laughs> I thought, oh, no. But uh, he was fine. But he didn't get squished either. So mm -hmm. that's why he was fine. How long does it take you to plan a trip like this? Oh, gee, plan? to plan the trip. Uh, we were actively working since January. Uh, there was a lot to do, um, arranging navigation stuff and uh, getting our equipment together. This, this was uh, such a major event. There was all of the camera considerations. I had never taken a large type of non-waterproof camera into such a harsh environment. And I actually, out. can I just say that the trip planning started like in August? In August. A year ago. Thank you, Diana. And Diana actually started before I did. She started in August. I started full time in, in January. So there's a bunch of questions in the chat. So I'll read some of them for you. Chris Lewis asked, what was the focal length of the lens used for the Grizzlies? It was 600 millimeters. And then Dee asked, what layers did you wear under your dry suits? Were you warm while paddling? Uh, yes, I was always warm when paddling. Uh, I could take the chance because I had an extra layer that I could put over if I uh, needed to, if I got cold. And I essentially wore the same layers I wear in California. In other words, there was a thin uh, underwear layer that I would wear uh, tops and bottoms, for warmer weather, if it was going to be, say, 65 degrees or below, I would, or if we were going towards the glaciers, then I would put on something warmer, perhaps my Mysterioso uh, heavier layer at the bottoms that would just keep me warm because the water is much colder there. And I would put on a Mysterioso top. And I think one day I actually had two Mysterioso tops but I think I never did that again. Uh, Leslie says, what were bears looking for or eating from under boulders? Oh, um, just intertidal life. Uh, could be mussels, could be blennies, uh, blennies just uh, anything that they found. And boy, they had to work hard. You know, those bears, they weigh hundreds of pounds and you can imagine that they, those critters are small. And, uh, for bears to get a full tummy on eating such small things, you could see why they didn't bother uh, even thinking about eating us because they had their work cut out for them. Unfortunately, we don't taste very good. We don't have very much fat. And Jen asked, why, why were you wearing rubber boots all the time? Um, that's what people wear in Alaska. On land. on land, because uh, the terrain is so buried. There can be puddles everywhere. Uh, there's reasonably good traction. Uh, they give uh, okay support. Uh, they work very, very well. Yes. High boots are desirable when you're uh, walking around in Alaska. So I actually, did, <laughs> okay, it, on land I had, my, uh, they call those Juno sneakers. And I had a pair of um, sandals, some um, keen sandals that I, I actually uh, didn't wear at all. I, it was just the, 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 kaya, the uh, Juno sneakers the whole time. Oh, I also had uh, some boots that I would wear in the kayak. They were some, some uh, 510 uh, kayak boots. You should ask if Diana or Frank would have anything. Okay, I'm seeing Diana in my view. Did you have anything to add, Diana or Frank? Diana, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, anything it's great, to add? It's a great place. I did want to make one little correction. 
Frank was not along in 2008. We weren't married then. I didn't know him. So those of you who know me probably thought, hmm, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, you misspoke, Rich. Oh, I well, did. You know, it's really hard when you're, when you're going through the whole thing. But Frank was uh, fortunately able to join us for the return to Glacier Bay, which was wonderful. And we had most the uh, regular crew. I do want to say that um, this screenshot, shot, I'm going to move my head. I used it today in um, honor of our friend, Ron, um, who was with us in 2008, but sadly, we had a Glacier Bay reunion to kind of talk about planning the next trip in September, and Ron uh, passed away before we could have that. He, um, he passed away from cancer, and we missed him sorely, but this was a wonderful picture. Let me move my head again. Um, this is our cooking shelter that we use, and this was a rainbow after one of our wonderful dinners in the East Arm um, when uh, Dick and I did the whole six weeks that trip, and uh, Ron and Francesca, who's uh, a friend of mine, joined us for the first three weeks, and then Rich and Vicky flew in, and that time they brought us a food resupply, so I didn't have to do all those logistics. Uh, Ron and Francesca took the empty bear cans away. And Rich and Vicky came in with the full bear cans for Dick and I. And so that was a wonderful time. We got to spend six whole weeks out in the um, back country without coming in, which was wonderful. And at the end of the time, when Dick and I were um, at the lodge getting ready to have dinner, I said, hey, Dick, this was a lot of hardship and a lot of miles. Would you do it again? And he said, in a heartbeat. <laughs> so we got to do that again one more time together. And um, what a great crew. It was really wonderful and we we shared memories that we'll have forever um some great photographers on this trip so um rich has been doing photography for a long time so kudos to you and frank and and all the different um uh, images that were shared and um anyway it, if you get a chance to go it's great the tides are no joke um, a lot of you have experience though in some of these areas um you just have to be prepared for it and be willing to either launch at the land of the midnight sun. You can launch at 2.30 in the morning if you don't want to do all the schlepping. Um, so that's what we did a lot. We tried to land on a falling tide and launch on a rising tide to make it easy whenever possible. Any more questions, Ellen? So Amelia asked if there were any capsizes in the cold water. Nope. Those are stable, stable boats. And, um, you know, I don't think we've ever capsized. No one's ever capsized in our feather crafts, even though we've been in some pretty rough seas. They're, they're very seaworthy and wonderful vessels. Mm -hmm. So I, I was interested to see that you had several bear encounters but no problems it sounds like um the park policies of of really educating visitors about safe safe ways of of preventing the bears from getting food seem to have worked well they do have a ranger crew oh sorry were you gonna take it frank okay. i was just gonna, yeah. I, I was just gonna say real briefly that um that that is true in general um, but when we did get back to the ranger station uh, from our return on the uh, west arm, we were told that uh, one of the uh, areas did get uh, have trouble with, um, I guess, a juvenile bear that, for whatever reason, decided to take apart some tents and things. So it, it does happen. And without knowing the details, maybe somebody left some food in a tent. Who knows? But... Um, Generally speaking, our encounters, the bears that we dealt with really could have cared less about us. But we were very careful also. We didn't have food in the tents. We All, all our food was, other than when we were eating it, was always in bear cans. So um, you just have to keep that in mind the whole time. You even remind yourself not to wipe your hands on your pants and wear those same pants in the tent, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I just wanted to say one other thing, um, and, and Rich, thank you so much for the, the great job. You, you really 
I know you only had a short time to encapsulate and a tremendous amount of, of, of time spent in the wild there. I think you, you captured it though. I just thank you for that. Um, I just wanna, you did mention briefly the planning and <laughs> I had the, I had the the passenger seat watching Diana do the planning for this. And let me tell you, it is, I would say as big a job of planning as, as almost the trip itself. So if you do wanna take this trip, um, one arm or both, um, planning is essential. It's not critical to, um, I mean, I don't, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. The planning can be done in a, a very, uh, if you do it in a very uh, organized way, but there's a lot of a um, lot of details. Everything from flights have to be coordinated with pickups from the airport to the hotels, and you're going to have a lot of baggage. And we had feather crafts which we shipped in our own travel bags, so you can imagine the weight of weight and numbers of our bags, and that all had to be coordinated. So. Um, uh, yeah, that in itself is is a, is a major major feat, but it's it's doable. So if you want to do this trip, um, just keep in mind the planning has to start well ahead of time, and um, be ready to be on the phone call phone a lot. And for whatever it was, maybe post COVID um, mess ups, but but boy, we sure had issues. Occasionally, we had issues with flights being canceled and things, which. Uh, but you're just going to have to prepare for that kind of little glitch now and then. Well, Frank, I might just add that in 2008, they put a bear harassment team of rangers together to go out and uh, shoot beanbags at bears and things like that to let them know that humans are not to be considered mm -hmm. as sources of food. Yeah. So they have their strategies to keep the bears well. Right. Yeah. So Rich, you had mentioned to me recently that um, you noticed big changes in the vegetation on these areas in the 14 years since you had been there. Um, I'm kind of curious to hear a little bit about that. Well, there were campsites that were devoid of trees years ago that now have been taken over by the larger uh, spruce trees and the hemlocks as well. So we have uh, less campsites available in that capacity. Another change that is significant is the amount of mud that is, uh, that is available, sucking mud they call it, at very low tides. Uh, it, this is mud that uh, if you step on it slowly, you sink down, but you try to pull your foot out of that mud, it uh, you can't. It ho holds on to your your boot, and you can sometimes just pull your foot right out of the shoe, and it's um, very very nasty. And apparently, it's becoming uh, quite widespread, especially in Adams Inlet. Uh, it looked to me like there were some over by Riggs Glacier when we were there as well. And so I think as time goes on, we'll see more places. Uh, where there is this kind of soft sucking mud that needs to be avoided. Diana, did you have any thoughts about that? Well, I had a personal experience with the sucking mud and one of my strategies was that I kind of kept my body over my kayak when I had to get out to help my front, one of my friends. Um, she was with us only the, for the first part in the Beardsleys and get out to help her. Um, so I kept my body over my kayak because my feet were sinking into the mud and I inched my way forward till I found a place with some gravel, um, kind of embedded in the mud. And once I got to that spot, I was able to get out and walk over to where she was, but it, it's, is, it is no joke. And it can be very terrifying if you start to sink into the mud and you think I'm not going to be able to pull myself out of this. So you might think about some strategies, particularly if you go into Adams Inlet, which is a wonderful place. Uh, we didn't do that this time. Um, we all did that last trip, but um, it's filling. We have It's being fed by so many glaciers and so much sediment that at certain tides, it's become fairly dangerous in there. So 
that's one thing you need to be aware of. It could actually be life uh, threatening if the tide starts rising and you can't get out of it. So that's something to take really seriously if you're starting to think about planning it. And there's some specific spots. And I want to also say that David's book that Rich talked about is a, an incredible resource. He has spent pro many Augusts there and he was an artist in residence, um, has wonderful photographs in the book, but he talks about some of the places where you have to worry about sucking mud. So that's something that you really wanna be aware of if you, if you start to plan a trip. There's areas where it's not as much of a problem because of the barnacles and the mussels and whatnot on the places where you have the outer marine environment, but in those inlets that are being fed, you know, the glacial mud is coming down. That's where you have to really be careful of that. And so I think that's one of the things to keep in mind if you're gonna plan a trip there. Great. Well, it is almost 9.30. Um, I'm really grateful for everyone staying around. We still have 48 participants logged in. Um, but uh, this is an amazing presentation. Um, thank you so much. I know so much work went into the trip and then in editing those photos was a huge job. I mean, the, the, the quality is just amazing. Um, thank you for sharing those with us.